You have stumbled upon or perhaps intentionally ended up here at my podcast, Actual Lead. No matter the path that led you here, I hope that you will hang out and join me for a truly enjoyable conversation. Let's get started. Hey everybody, welcome to Actual Lead. Uh, I hope you guys had a good week and I'm here with uh, Nathaniel. He uh, on a podcast called At the Devil's Ball Podcast. You have a you have a co-host, right? So there's like two of you. Yes. Yep. And then uh, your podcast is about. I haven't listened to it yet, so I'm going to no. subscribe to it after this. But I haven't. Oh no worries. Uh, no worries. Not many people do. Um, so uh, <laughs> I feel we have that. A, yeah, we have a we have our our average is somewhere between twenty and thirty, usually around like twenty four. Um, but we're excited about having that. So we're you know like that's that's like four times we, more than I get. So yeah. Uh, yeah, another friend of ours who does another podcast does the same thing where he's like, he's been doing it for years and he's like, I don't get anywhere near that. And I'm like, I feel badly, but, um, but no, it's a, it's a, it's a fun show. We've been doing it for about four years. Uh, we got it started during the pandemic. Um, and then we just talk about horror films, uh, and occasionally not horror films in a positive and constructive manner. That's our tagline, um, where we just, um, uh, we, we, the thing is that we love movies. And so uh, there's more than enough. We're both older, you know, straight, white, cisgendered males. So we figured there's enough of those out there running around how much they hate everything. Um, you know, and so we're trying to do the opposite. We're trying to talk about how much we like these things. Um, not sometimes now the horror genre being what it is. Sometimes that's not always easy. Um, and sometimes the movies we watch are, are sometimes pretty bad. But we try to find the positive in it. Um we're more analytical than critical, although we do do some uh, uh, critical analysis on occasion. But um, and we just try to have fun with these movies, and um, and and we've been doing it for a while, and we just love doing it. Uh, I love podcasting, and um, which is funny because I'm actually in real life, I'm actually really introverted and not very talkative. Um, and so I, uh, it's really interesting to kind of jump on one of these and be outgoing and then uh you know in real life i just kind of sit here and watch movies and it's kind of all i really do yeah. um yeah i'm really awkward actually in real life so and i might be awkward here because uh normally i'm used to having a topic so i'm a little bit like i'm gonna i'm gonna roll with it and we're gonna have <laughs> <Yeah>. a good time <laughs> i but. i i felt your discomfort when you asked about the topic and then when i was like no no we just talk and i could feel it coming through the <laughs> the screen but um so yeah, i i'm pretty like i like to keep to myself and i spend a lot of time alone but i talk a lot and so like the joke is that i'm like the introvert whisperer because um not only am i awkward i'm really comfortable being awkward and i will happily take all of the weight and pressure in a conversation so if somebody else is just not comfortable but they're really happy listening i can do all the work so it like it takes that pressure off and um i have pretty good luck with people that are normally quiet being more engaging in conversations and stuff because i'm just easy like that you know i can do that with the right with the right person um i don't know if i could just do it off the cuff but if i have uh you know uh and the the funny thing is actually that um recently i just moved to cleveland where my co-host lives so now we hang out in person for the first time after all these times and he's actually also super super quiet so i end up having to do the heavy lifting in those conversations but i love the guy so i'm like able to do that and pull that out of him um, yeah. But also, we're both very comfortable sitting in silence and watching a movie. Uh, yeah. so that's also really nice. But no, uh, uh, but on the podcast, we're lightning quick. You know, we're able to have a full conversation. And then when it's done, we just kind of deflate. <laughs> yeah, it's because you guys uh, are focused on basically special interests that you share. Yeah. And then, yeah, you have like a yeah, I'm not good at like, I mean, I have things that I can info dump about, but they're like, like it's so many different things. I don't have like a thing. And and the area that like I am the least interested is like movies and visual media and stuff. I've just not, you know, like and it's always been this thing that I felt a little bit like um, inadequate when I would hang out with other people because movies are very important to like a lot of people. Right. Really? Yeah. And and I'm like, um, if a movie is really popular, I don't want to see it it's been ruined for me because everybody's talking about it. And mm. if the reason why it's ruined for me is that while I'm sitting in the movie, all of that 
all of those comments and things are running through my head and it allows me to unlock stuff about the movie way before everybody else. Yeah. So it, it's, you know, it spoils it, even though they're not giving spoilers, their feelings are spoilers. Yes. Um, no, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Cause my brain t knows enough about those people to know why they would say that. Um, so I tend not to watch movies until later. And then also like I've always been poor, so I've never been able to afford to go see a movie when it's new. So I just, I just watch shit when it's free, you know? Right. Um, and, uh, and I just don't, it's so disconnected from everybody else. I can't stay in movie theaters because of the sensory experience. Um, if I could go by myself to one of the ones with the recliners, that would be awesome. But yeah. because other people like look at their phone and they, they wrinkle papers and they eat and I can't, and then, you know, can't handle it at all. So I'm very happy yeah. watching movies at home. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I, um, for me, like the, I like TV shows more now because the what's always been hard for me with movies is there's not enough story. You okay. know, it's like, mm -hmm. like, um, I think a lot of people, they watch the movies and there's sort of a story that's implied through the writing, but you have to rely on assumptions, sort of fill it in with your own imagination or whatever. And a lot of people, that's fine for them. They'll just like have that experience and have, you know, it's. But for me, my brain doesn't work that way. So when I watch a movie, if that information is not there, I'm like, it feels really empty. Um, and with TV shows, they they are able to stretch it out and give you all this backstory like a book, basically. Mm -hmm. And yep. um, that's like I've I used to just not care. Like I haven't had uh, cable TV since like 97. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I just never like. I just never really cared about that stuff. And um, now that there's like been good TV shows with like good stories coming out more and more, I've been like, oh, well, I like this one. I like that one. That's pretty cool. You know, I'm not super passionate about it. And you're probably very rarely going to hear me talking about them every mm -hmm. now and again. I'll be like, hey, that one was cool. But that's it. Like, you know, I just don't have the. So I do find it interesting when other people are when, when they're sharing their experiences. And, mm -hmm. you know that's cool but like i just tend not to be able to participate in the same way and then i always think so differently you know like mm -hmm. my perspective is so off the side that people are like i'll make people mad so. <laughs> oh no you gotta yeah you just gotta you gotta talk to the right people yeah for sure i mean social media can be a very difficult place to discuss uh visual media uh, for a lot of the reasons, I've never tried to do it online. Ever, I've only yeah. ever done it in person. I don't, I don't care about people's opinions online. So. Yeah. Well, they get they they can get damaging. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, to what you said about uh, you know uh, people's uh, perceptions of things coloring uh, your experience of it. I mean, that is a difficult thing. There are there are things, movies that I've loved that I don't love as much anymore simply because people have you know spent a lot of time shitting on. Them. I can can I swear yeah. on this? Oh my gosh! Yeah, I didn't yeah, you, yeah, okay. you yeah. Um, but no, like people will will get negative about it. You know, um, I like I like superhero films. I've been a comic book fan since I was a kid, um, and uh, you know there are uh, subsections of that fandom that are exceptionally difficult to deal with, and they end up ruining things. You know, I just yeah. can't watch them anymore. Um, you know, I, I, uh, it's, it's difficult. Like I'm a big, I, I, the older I get, the more I like Superman, you know, mm -hmm. I, I've be coming around on that character and really, really enjoying, uh, enjoying him. And then you see all these negative comments about like, you know, like, well, the only one that's worth anything is Zack Snyder's. And I'm like, no, his is the worst one. Uh, but it does, it ends up making watching these films difficult because I'm thinking yeah. I can't help think about like, you know, right now there's a bunch of angry nerds who really hate what's going on right now yeah um and so yeah and i mean i i don't like going to the movies anymore either i used to um but for the same reasons you mentioned it's it's really uh that experience has gotten progressively worse and worse as time go, has gone on um and i'm not even sure entirely why that is um a lot of people blame the pandemic and i'm like yeah maybe but uh you know people got used to watching stuff at home and now they bring that same energy to uh, the movie theaters, but I don't know. I think it might just be that the decline of uh, uh, basic social decency. I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah, it could be. Yeah. yeah, it's 
I don't know. I've I always had a hard time with the the theater experience, and it, it definitely. I haven't been to the movies since before COVID, but it. Um, I can only imagine with the way that people have changed in other ways that it it can't be. It it, ha it hasn't gotten any better there. Um, yeah. yeah, the you know the thing with like all these different iterations of characters where you have somebody else that comes in and draws them and writes them and stuff. Like, I have a friend who's very. Um, He's very about the canon and he's very rigid and he has a really hard time with like these different iterations. And like sometimes like he'll see stuff online where people are and he gets all like, Rrr, you know, like and and he'll call me and, and talk about it. And um, I am very like I just kind of accept what people decide to do. And I, you know, so when there's like a book I really like and they come out with like a movie and they change certain aspects of the character enough that it, I even if I don't end up not enjoying it because I just don't enjoy the story or whatever um I treat them as like multiverse type things right so it's just a different iteration sure. and that way I can just accept that person's um exploration of that that fantasy like on their terms and I just don't it's like I go did I enjoy the story ignoring what I know about the books or whatever yes okay well there you go. Did I, did I, for me, it's very like sensory. Like, did I feel good while I was experiencing this and how did I feel afterwards? And if I felt good, right. then I liked it. And that's kind of it, you know? So like when people get all like, but it's not canon and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, I don't fucking care. No, yeah, I've like, never been a, I, I used to be a canon nerd when I was younger. Um, now I've come to love uh, adaptation um, and, and variety in these types of stories. And so it, it, um, I've never been the type of guy to like, you know, like remakes get a, uh, not, not, you know, not many of them are that great, but a lot of people tend to get really riled up about them. And I, I generally am, am just sort of like, well, it's just somebody else's take on this. Like that's okay. That's yeah. valid. It's like a, know. song covers, you know, people like yeah, song, I love those too. Yeah. A, a song makes somebody passionate in a way where they're, they want to experience performing it. And mm -hmm. in their own language. And I don't have to like that language. Or maybe I will like that. I mean, there's a lot of Depeche Mode songs I did not like the originals of, but I love a ton of the covers of, right? And yeah. I have to appreciate that Depeche Mode wrote the originals to allow these covers that I love to exist. It's fine. Whatever. Like, you know, it's, I don't know. I just, I think I'm just more accepting than a lot of people. But I also think a lot of people are judgmental because they can be. Yeah. Like, you know, it's not it's not really that important to them. They just, it's, I don't know. It's like a thing. It's, it's like hating clowns. Everybody decided that clowns are scary. And after like the 2014 or something and it became a fad. And so now everybody agrees with it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, y'all weren't like this before. Come on. Oh, well, there was, <laughs> there was, there was clown clown phobia before 2014. Yeah. But that was but... like, it was different the way it was handled yeah. the, with the language around it. And it wasn't like, it wasn't everybody. You know, and when no. I talk when I talk to people who are like legitimately scared of clowns, the way that they communicate it is totally different than the fad people who just, you know, in in what way? Like, um, I'm trying to think like of a good example. You know, like I'll have somebody be like, you know, I've always had a really hard time with clowns. They they just freak me out, and um, the way that they'll like respond to um when I'm doing clown stuff, you know, um, there's sort of like an input there of how it makes them feel. And it's more, it's communicated in a way that sounds like they've actually experienced the emotions and they're conveying that experience when, you know, and then you just have people who are just like, I don't, you know, I don't like clowns and, oh, they're scary. And, you know, and there's no like depth to it at all. And it, and that type of like talking about it came after the um internet fad thing with the scare scare clowns where the people were running around like in, i remember in, that yeah you know mm -hmm. in like the most boring like masks ever and um you know like there's that that's the the um where it's like sort of like a fad thing and if you like like in person if you watch like their reactions to stuff they don't look uncomfortable there's none of the micro expressions or any right. of that that suggests that there's like a real emotional reaction happening you know so it's yeah yeah 
Well, no, I think you're right. I think people do claim, um, was it cult cultophobia? Um, is that what it's called? I can't remember now. Um, but that's the, the fear of clowns. Um, and that, you know, an actual phobia does tend to uh, exhibit actual physical reactions. Um, and so I think you might be right. I mean, I think that people online may have, you know, a lot of stuff does, uh, I think, dovetail back to social media and the way we communicate with one another and the way we get those endorphins. So we, we like to agree with each other. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's, um, I don't want to get off on way. a of it, but like terrifier right now is like really in. Um, and I had to put that in my muted words. I list. did. I did it last night. I did. Too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I did I it two nights ago. I was just like, dude. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I mean, like, but I think that um, in some ways that's being overinflated by the collective experience of enjoying something together or not enjoying something together. And so you can yeah. say, well, clowns are uh, understand that people are be, people tend to understand that clowns are scary. Maybe they don't know why. Uh, Cause I remember back, you know, uh, back in the day um, and I'm old enough to say back in the day, um, you know, there were some actual legitimate reasons to be afraid of clowns. Uh, you know, John Wayne Gacy, um, you know, there were um, uh, Stephen King's it, which of course came out, uh, was written in 82. Uh, you know, they have, um, there is actual stuff there. Uh, yeah. You know, Ronald well, McDonald was creepy, you know. Yeah. Well, and I have like a whole theory around why, because clowns, like the traditional clown makeup creeps me out, too. And, it, and even as a kid, like they made me very uncomfortable. Um, and I think that it has to do with the fact that the makeup um, overrides the human being's facial expressions. Right. Sure. So it's like you can't see what their eyebrows are doing or are they really smiling or not? And it's mm. there's something there that like when you can't read those expressions I mean rely so heavily on that information um and that's like like when I do my makeup like I make sure that my facial expressions define what my face is doing not my makeup right. um and I think that's part of why people who have clown phobias are able to use what I'm doing to help them desensitize right like yeah um because there's that you know but I I think that that plays into it because like yeah there's like these social associations and of of like you know the serial killer and stuff like that but i i think that there's actually like a sort of um that this this thing that you don't even realize that you're experiencing when you can't read someone's facial expressions that goes ooh mm -hmm, uncomfortable well that used to be the that used to be the number one thing used to people used to say i remember uh, uh toby hooper um did an interview where he talked about how clowns were frightening because you couldn't it could be anybody under there was the number mm -hmm. one thing that used to be said um yeah and like I said, I think that ties back to, you know, uh, imagery of, say, like John Wayne Gacy, you know, where they're like, you know, this is a guy who used uh, something that was supposed to be fun and amusing to target children. And yeah. so, you know, when you have when you grow up with that imagery as children, you start wondering, is every clown going to try and kill me? Um, and then, you know, Stephen King's it, which Stephen King himself has said, like, clowns hate him. The entire <laughs> clown industry hates him. Because he invented Pennywise. Uh, and in that book, he cites John Wayne Gacy and then he cites um, uh, Bozo, Bozo the Clown, yeah. uh, as his main inspirations for how he described Pennywise yeah. in, the, in the novel. And so like these these two things collide and ultimately result in a lot of in an entire generation of people who were raised on the idea that clowns are in some way frightening or dangerous. Uh, I always thought them to be, as a kid, innocuous. You know, I'm like, okay, they're going to do, you know, they're going to do some cartwheels or whatever and throw pies at mm -hmm. each other. You know, it never really bothered me. And, but I mean, the reason why I followed you on Twitter was, I was like, Hey, there's a pretty girl in a clown. <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, and then you, you turned out to be pretty cool and everything. I was like, oh, okay, cool. But I was like, Oh wow. Clown. Um, you know, and I, you know, that's kind of, you know, neat, but, um, but yeah, so, I mean, it, it always has, um, I dated a woman who was like really, really afraid of clowns and I, I made her watch it and she, <laughs> uh, but she was, she was, she was willing, she was willing yeah, to do yeah. it, but she, she watched it and she actually ended up which, kind of enjoying which one? the film. Uh, the 2017, uh, okay. the chapter one was the one she okay. watched with me. Uh, she ended up, uh, she ended up enjoying it actually. But, um, but yeah. I've also, I, she wasn't the first woman that I had dated who was afraid of clowns. Um, and, um, 
another one refused to watch it. Another woman I dated refused to watch any of the it's because <laughs> she was terrified of clowns. But she was actually older. She was in her 50s. And so yeah. she was uh, she was like, I don't want to, you know, uh, she's like she grew up in that era of the John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. So she was like, you know, you know, I never heard of him until like the last couple of years. Is that weird? Yeah. Like, I just never it I it, it never came up like in anything. I, I read it twice before i was 12 i I, sure. I i grew up on stevie king yeah um and it for me was like i i like identified so much with like the kids in that book like oh for sure and yeah. like and then i got to have like because i never like had friends or whatever so like i i that whole experience that they had of like the bonding summer thing and playing was like so like i just kind of would like reread it and love it plus like the scene when the kids are all lighting their farts on fire that one i reread and laughed at that like a hundred times yeah. <laughs> but um and then like to me like i know that like the visual that pennywise put out there was clown because he was trying to lure kids in lure and kids all that in, yeah. stuff but pennywise was an alien yeah like, you know, so my brain doesn't like there's no Pennywise isn't a clown. So the visual didn't like I never had that association. It was totally disconnected for me. Oh, no, you're right. Pennywise Pennywise was was one of many uh, forms yeah. that it takes in that book. Um, you know, it's um, and a lot of them were deliberately designed to prey on ordinary social fears. Like, you know, I mean, it's been famously noted that you know, it becomes a big spider basically at the end of the film, at the end of the story. Yeah. Uh, and because people are terrified of spiders, um, yeah. which is another thing I never really uh, got too into. However, spider phobia, ten arachnophobia tends to come from, I guess, from a, uh, I've read that, I don't know how true this is, but I've read it, that um, we actually have a fear of spiders because spiders used to be really, really big when we were like cavemen and they would, <laughs> you know, kill you like they were really really dangerous and so like you know for the same reason why we're kind of naturally afraid of bears um yeah you know but um, i just the the anything with too many legs i sure. make me uncomfortable i'm not i'm not phobic but i'm yeah, uncomfortable i'm just like you know get the vacuum yeah the only <laughs> thing that yeah the only thing that has ever uh, the only like insect or arachnid that has ever really given me an actual visceral response were cockroaches. I remember the first time I saw a cockroach and I was repulsed like it was a genuine. And I, I remember thinking about it at the time being like, why is this bothering me as much as it is? And I'm like, oh, it's it's a socially infused, uh, you know, maybe even genetic uh, response because cockroaches automatically mean uh you know disease or or uh, yeah except you know. they don't most cockroaches no, don't. are just they they like to hang outside and then they wander inside and they get lost inside it's those german cockroaches are the ones that have the negative that have the diseases and cause all the health issues and the breathing issues and all that stuff those are the ones yeah. you gotta you gotta worry about i don't well, know well yeah, once you have a couple of them in your house though then there's a million of them yeah you know, exactly and that's really the problem is the infestation um yeah. i had and i it, had one before i moved here to cleveland and it was not fun yeah, but, I have most of the places I've lived at, I see them on occasion. This place, I see them a little more frequently, but it's just the like the standard outside ones that get yeah. lost and wander in. Mm -hmm. And, um, they're, you know, and then they're, I'm sure they're in the walls, but they're not like, you know, it's right. like my cat kills it. It's just like, a, and they're babies. So mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah. And they spray for him here, which <sighs> I have mixed feelings about that because it, it feeds into the issue in the long run by making them immune to the poisons but True. at the same time you know i also don't want them to, to take over right but, uh, i worry because my brain will. worries about the german cockroaches because of the disease and i worry about bed bugs like oh my god like yeah i i was so worried about living in a place with shared walls again and there's like these are like rows of six townhouses together so like sure. i went and put um the bags that you put over your mattress and stuff like that when you have bed bugs i put them on there before i moved in to protect them so that if bed bugs ever show up, I don't have to get a new mattress or anything. I can like, sure. you know, I was just like, Oh my God. <laughs> oh, they're, they're, well, they're nasty business. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you don't want to deal with those, but yeah, they just, I don't know. I'm so, you know, <sighs> we need them though. I'm, not, I'm sure they, I'm sure they provide something in the, the ecosystem that we're not 
we're not aware of, you know? Probably. Yeah. I mean, something, I mean, I'm sure something eats them. Yeah, yeah exactly. So, but, um, yeah. so do you have like, um, movies that you really enjoyed that like other people just don't really know about that much? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, thinking of them off the top of my head, I'm not certain of, um, but yeah, the, uh, quite a few, I mean, there, uh, I try to keep up with, um, occasionally making lists, particularly with horror, because there's a lot of stuff that, uh, I think people don't know about, um, that are usually a lot of fun. Uh, but a lot of people gave them a pass or didn't see them or, um, it's particularly in the early two thousands, um, at the very tail end of the direct to video market, um, I used to, and when movie, uh, when uh, video stores were closing, um, I used to go buy like armfuls of VHS tapes, you know, because they were selling them for like 10 cents, you know, because they were going out of business. Um, and DVDs were taking over anyway. And I would pick up stuff randomly um, and watch it. And I would, you'd have to dig through like, you know, six or seven films. And then you'd get to one that's like, oh, wow, this is actually pretty good. Uh, they had no money or, you know, time or whatever, but they did a pretty good film. Um, uh, there's one that I, I do particularly like called the, uh, it's called the attic, attic expeditions. And it, uh, it's it actually of all people has Seth green in it. <laughs> um, it was made, um, and it stars, the star of the film is Andrews Jones, who was best known for, um, playing the character of Rick in nightmare on Elm street four. Um, and he, uh, he's the star of it. It's got Seth green. It's got, um, um uh, oh lord um my friend sarah is gonna kill me because i'm blanking on his name he played um herbert west in reanimator um jeff jeffrey combs uh, is in it um and it's a it's a really fun weird little film that was clearly made for very little money but it's very creative and very inventive um and i, I that movie i feel like i'm the only one that's seen it <laughs> yeah know, i've never even uh, never even heard of it but it feels yeah. like with those names that people would have seen it yeah, but nobody yeah. did. Um, yeah. And it was a film I picked up, um, you know, for uh, two bucks at a, a movie gallery that was closing in, in southern Maine. And I uh, I brought it home. I watched it and was really excited to see Andrews Jones in it because I loved him in Nightmare 4. Uh, and then I was like, well, you know, on the cover, it's got Seth Green and Jeffrey Combs. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, OK. So, yeah, that was fun. I mean, like, I'm a big uh, I'm a big fan of like outside of horror in general. I, I really like kind of more surrealistic or um, absurdist films. I'm a big David Lynch fan. Um, uh, Michael Haneke, uh, you know, those types of guys that make really weird, sometimes upsetting films, but they're not as upsetting as deliberately upsetting films, if that makes sense. Um, there's a whole subgenre now of, what they're calling now, I think, feel bad movies, or uh, there's a meme going around that's like, uh, uh, I think it was called uh, uh, the thanks now I feel awful genre of film starter kit, and it's like Hereditary <laughs> and uh, Eden Lake and a bunch of martyrs and uh, films that I generally I, I enjoyed the one time, and I don't think I'll yeah. go back to. I loved Hereditary. Um, I mean, I don't, oh, yeah, I don't remember it being a bad feel film i just but i i love that actress uh tony tony collette yeah yeah I, I, anything she's in i'll watch it um oh, for sure she's fantastic yeah. Yeah. so but yeah yeah there are like apocalypse now that movie is that the worst i hated that movie so much not because it was poorly done but because it made me feel real bad it was oh, a yeah. bad experience like yeah and i was like i will and i was angry at my friends for making me watch it like it was just you know i was like when i was younger i was really into horror just like because it made me happy it was just like yeah. where my where my brain was as a teenager and stuff and you know like i mean i had read the the hellraiser book like because I, I love clive barker but um i'm a big I, clive barker fan yeah but you know i was really when the movie came i was really exciting because it was actually really well done yeah. and and then it was you know so i still probably have the vhs's from from back then somewhere in a box somewhere but um, all those movies are so much like fun just like I mean because Nightmare on Elm Street is so goofy you know it's so goofy like the humor in it and stuff is just mm -hmm. like yeah there's like this aspect of like 
uh, you know, once you're go to sleep and you die and whatever, you know. But um, yeah, that stuff like lived in my imagination as a kid. Like I would, you know, play games. Like I was taking the trash out and and it would be like, oh, you always gonna get me if I step on the step, so I'd always have to jump over that step. And you know, yep. um, but yeah, after I had my son, I got really sensitive to like everything, and then okay. I couldn't I couldn't watch um horror movies anymore. Matter of fact, I almost passed out mm. watching Train Spotting, like. Yep. Um, like literally went take the baby I'm going to faint you know <laughs> it yeah. was just like what the hell and then in the last couple of years I started being able to like I think it was a PTSD thing because I had really severe PTSD and I didn't know that that I had that um, yeah and um, just the last few years I started being like where I can enjoy things again um, so you know it's like I started watching some stuff like watch smile and hereditary mid midsummer Okay. And um, smile made me mad, and I yelled at it through most of it. <laughs> and I did. I was a new, big fan. Yeah. Yeah, I was just like, rawr, rawr. but um, and I did watch the new Evil Evil Dead. Um, and I like, I like the um. Insidious movies a lot. I like I enjoyed those, too. those. Yeah. Um. The Evil Dead's funny. I saw the first movie when I was like fourteen. You know, mm -hmm. it was like a really long time ago, but it was like when nobody knew about it. It was like yep. it was not it was not a thing yet, you know, and it was really interesting to watch it become a thing and um, have it be like a lot of fun. And the TV show is a lot of fun as well. My my favorite, like more current movie that I'm actually really surprised not more people know about and like in the the her community on X, like um, is what we do in the shadows like okay, yeah. some people have heard of the TV show, but they haven't heard of the movie. And I'm like, <laughs> cause like yeah. I heard the I've like, I don't watch movies more than once very often. I've watched that movie like eight times. Like I literally like, you gotta watch this movie. And I make it was like, <laughs> because it's so funny and it makes me very happy. But um, I like, it was announced and it wasn't gonna be released here. And so I had to get a friend in the UK when it was released on DVD to buy it send it to me so that i could change the the um whatever the region on my computer so that i could rip it and then i you know when i sent him his christmas present i sent him the movie back so i'm like i'm you know and now i have the file you mm -hmm. know I, that's like i was so excited about it without like having access to it i just was like i must get it you know it's such yeah. a and now um, it's a cult favorite yeah yeah, exactly. It's such a and then there's the the spin-off show um about the cops. That's a lot of fun as well. Um I can't remember what it's called, but um it's very dry humor. It's so like you watch it and you're like, how did they keep it straight? And they don't, you know, sometimes you can tell the actors were laughing before they they took the scene they used because you can yeah, see sure. the lines and they're like, they don't even have the lines. And I'm like, how do they do that? <laughs> <laughs> so i love that dry humor though yeah i'm a big fan of dry humor yeah yeah uh, that's more my more my thing i was a big bill murray fan um in particular his films like you know like ghostbusters or uh groundhog day or where he's a little bit drier um, yeah those are those are my brother watched ghostbusters like every day for like four years when i was yeah. a kid and you never mind it it's like even if you're not watching it you never mind just hearing it in the background that's probably one of the films I have seen the most in my life. I've watched that movie many, many times. I've seen it in theaters a couple times now, uh, you know, but yeah, I've watched it many, many times and you're right. It doesn't really get old. You, you just keep, even if you know, I mean, I can probably recite that entire film from beginning to end, um, but I still enjoy watching it. And yeah. I, I, it's weird because it's one of the very few films that I can do that with, but I can still watch it on a drop of a hat. I don't mind you know yeah yeah no that's yeah. a great film yeah yeah i haven't watched that movie in a long time but i don't like yeah yes it's yeah. it it good yeah my my son it's funny because my brother had movies he watched all the time and then my son had his which was jurassic park and men in black those were his two okay those are both you know it's like you hear about like kids watching stuff over and over again it's like tormentive but at least my son picked things that were enjoyable that you can kind of just sit down through like and it, it come you know you hear the scene seeps into your brain and you're like i don't mind it <laughs> yeah no jurassic park is a is a great film 
I mean, yeah. that's, uh, you know, there's, uh, I don't think anything good came after that, but like, <laughs> um, you know, but yeah, Jurassic Park is a beautiful, it's, it's absolutely wonderful. It's another one I've seen many, many times that I can probably watch at any, at any given moment and have a good time with. Um, Spielberg was really good at that though. I mean, like a lot of Steven Spielberg pre 2000, I mean, like there's a lot that, you know, you can, Indiana Jones, you can watch a million times, you know. Um, those are fun. Um, yeah. but yeah, I mean, no, totally. I, I don't have kids myself. Um, not, at least not that I know of. And, um, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm kind of grateful for that. I, uh, I, because I think, like you mentioned earlier, like, uh, a friend of mine had, um, it was the last guy I ever thought would have kids. He had $3 and like, suddenly he was like, I can't watch pet cemetery anymore. And I was like, why is that? And he's like, well, there's a baby gets run over by a truck. And I'm like, ah, I guess you're right. I guess that would be rough if you were a parent. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was such but, a good book. But yeah, it it, yeah. it definitely, yeah, having a kids do change. The thing that like was hard for me in relation to movies and having kid wasn't even like losing my relationship with like horror. It was feeling obligated to take him to the new Disney movie or the new Pixar movie or whatever because I mean some of the earlier Pixar stuff was like good but like I just it, it get you know I don't like Disney stuff pretty much ever but um the it just gets so old like you know it's just not so I was very excited when he got to the age where he he was ready to start watching more complex stuff like when he got to the age that because I, I wouldn't ever make him watch something he wasn't comfortable with so right um when he was like I'm ready to watch the alien movie I was like yes and we watched yeah. it together and he really enjoyed right. it you know and and that was like super exciting but I had to wait for him to like be ready for that so. sure yeah no, it's actually funny. Pet Cemetery. I um, I was ter- I'm still terrified of that movie because my mother watched it. It was like on a uh, back in the day. I mean, I don't think the young people remember realize this happens. It used to happen. Uh, it was like a Sunday afternoon. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was on TV. Yeah. On cable. And my it's mother was watching it. And I went into the kitchen to get something came out and saw it happened to walk in during the uh, Aunt Zelda stuff. And uh, I I went sheet white. And was like, and I, I still have a difficult time watching those scenes, even as an adult, because I remember how terrified I was when I was a kid. But yeah, yeah sometimes you couldn't. It's interesting now that in the in the early 21st century, um, you can ha- you have way more control over what your kids can see. Because um, back when I was a kid, you just sometimes found this stuff on cable in the middle yeah. of a Sunday afternoon. And um, it ultimately worked out for me. Cause I love those things. But um, in fact, I used to talk about this all the time. And one of the reasons why I like Tubi um, as a streaming service is because it emulates that late night cable feel where, yeah. you know, you'd watch TV at 11 o'clock at night, suddenly come across the weirdest damn shit on, <laughs> on cable. And, you know, you know, mom had gone to bed and I would just kind of be like, Oh, I'm getting away with something. And I would watch <laughs> like these, like, you know, nightmare on Elm street films and stuff. You'd find this stuff on cable you didn't used to be able to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, well, you used to be able to, now you kind of can't because I don't think anybody has cable anymore, but, yeah. um, now it's just streaming and now, you know, but this is why they put like child locks on all of these accounts now. And, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's interesting to, to think of it from that perspective because, and that's part of the reason why I'm grateful. I don't have kids because I can watch whatever I want, whenever I want to watch it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but, um, but no, I mean, I, 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 would, I can't imagine trying to actually navigate that, um, uh, especially when I was in, you know, more of a age to have children when I was in my 20s or 30s, um, where I could barely take care of myself, let alone a child. But I mean, right. like it's, um, but yeah, to, to just navigate or be conscientious about what you're watching um, yeah. is such an odd, uh, odd thing to think about because I've never had to do it. So yeah. it's a, yeah. I think like um a lot of parents also do stuff based on like what what is um externally perceived as appropriate versus what is actually appropriate for the child where they're at psychologically and stuff because sure. all kids are different, right? And so they'll be right. like, Oh, well, that has sex, they can't be exposed to that. My son and I, we watched Penn and Teller's bullshit when he was very small and it had a ton of nudity nudity in it. And that's part of why we watched it, is because it was non-sexualized nudity, right? And I 
I think that it's very important to be exposed to the naked body without it being sexualized. Um, sure. You know, and and when parents are like, oh, they shouldn't be exposed to that and they make a big deal about it, they they feed into the shame thing that causes that that connection to sexualizing nudity. Right. So I was right. like, no, we, we swear we did all that stuff. I wanted him to be exposed to like real world things and be able to navigate the world around him. Um, but at the same time, like if something made him uncomfortable, like a movie or story, or whatever, we always talked about beforehand. And I always respected that. I tried to, it's, you know, I think people forget to have empathy for their kids and forget to see them as a separate entity from themselves. And that was something Absolutely. that like, I was, maybe I just never forgot what it was like to be a kid because my parents did not, my parents, whatever they watched, I watched it with them. There was yeah. no censorship. So like, you know, I saw the howling when I was seven and that shit fucked me up. And sure. like, you know, the sex scene where he like, he starts uh, transforming and stuff at nightmares. Like, yeah. um, you know, and they used to do the drive-in, go to the drive-in theater and watch horror films when I was like three or four. And I remember squeaky shoes. I never saw movie with squeaky mm -hmm. shoes I, I don't remember that one bothering me but it's there was a lot of stuff that it was very stressful and then I was told that I shouldn't be having that reaction to it and I was just like oh I'm not going to do that and it does but it does take like a lot of like work to be mindful of this other human being in like a courteous like conscious conscientious way rather than just mm -hmm. making decisions based on like the labels that are put onto things you right. know um yeah the thing you said about censorship that I have been kind of like perplexed by recently is, um, you know, when I was small, language on TV was very strict, right? George yeah. Carlin got in a lot of trouble by like challenging that kind of stuff. And, and then it started to like, be like, well, you can swear after like 10 PM or whatever, you know, like not like you say like ass and bitch. And then it like expanded where now you hear the F bomb and stuff. And that stuff's yeah. just built into TV all the time. And it's, it's on, on TV. Um, but it's also like on streaming and stuff, but on social media stuff gets bleeped out all the time, not just swear words, but things like the word, like abuse mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. blood and you know and i'm like how did how did we go from opening up to being even more strict than we were before like yeah. and and nobody's talking about it and i'm like it makes me very uncomfortable i'm that's why i'm like even though youtube's like blah, 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 you know i'm not going to monetize because i refuse to stop swearing because they're just right. fucking words like yeah. Yeah. It's all about, oh, yeah, content, they got, you know, I'm not yeah. using them in an abusive way. So it's not a fucking problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And you've got younger, you've got younger YouTubers and stuff uh, that are uh, using the word unalive uh, instead of yeah. kill or, or murder TikTok or whatever. TikTok started that. Yeah. And it's like, you know, uh, uh, running a horror podcast, there'd be no way, uh, yeah. you know, like we could try that, but I mean, like there'd be no way to, to do euphemistic conversation for an entire hour, hour, 15 hour 20 um you know that uh there'd be no way you know yeah. uh yeah exactly and i i don't understand how people can have um healthy conversations around anything that involves that stuff if they can't use the words like that's the whole right. like reason of why you know is important to teach children how to use the correct words for their genitals right is because mm -hmm. they need to be able to have conversations about it be it with a doctor or whoever right right or, or just in relation to their own body and their needs and like you know and then now all of a sudden it's like you're not supposed to say like suicide or what and i'm like it, this just seems very unhealthy to me like no know? i agree for sure uh you know i, I uh it, it is it, it is weird to to see a largely more restrictive uh movement within our culture um you know uh it recently uh you know in horror uh horror fans on twitter there's a whole conversation about that comes up every once in a while on film twitter in particular about sex scenes in movies and there's a whole subsection of people now that are like sex scenes in movies are bad and yeah. i'm like i don't really i mean like they they at worst they're unnecessary um but they and they provide a you know uh a titillation or you know there there's a reason why sex was in a lot of horror films it was meant to sell 
to teens, you know, young people who wanted yeah. to see boobies, so they'd go see boobies. Um, you well, know, but, but yeah, mainly, mainly, mainly men. I mean, all the mainly marketing men. was towards men, but yeah, yeah, it, yeah. Well, I'm asexual, so like, sex scenes are just unnecessary. Like, I'm sure. always like. Why is this in here if it's just plugged in? If they build it into the story, which a yeah. lot of a lot of times with like horror films, it's actually more integrated into the story than it is with other movies, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like like you'll even have context for what, you know, why they're doing that. So I'm like if it's built into the story, then I don't care. It's how they film it that I care about. Are they sure. objectifying the the human like the female are they objectifying both of them if it's equal opportunity objectification that's fine if they're yeah. only objectifying like one person i have a problem with that if if they're not objectifying and it's just artsy fartsy and whatever cool whatever mm -hmm. you know that's like to me it's the con it's like the context and yeah and yeah. i have noticed that people get very like and then you know yeah I mean, my biggest like, my biggest arguments against her is some of my favorite films have very specific sex scenes like Mulholland Drive is my favorite movie of all time. And there is a sex scene between two women in that film. And there are people that tend to criticize it and say, oh, it's it's male gaze. It's it's and I'm like, well, no, the entire point of the scene is they're making love. But one of them is deeply in love and the other does not love her back. And there is a whole point in that where she says, I'm in love with you. And the other character says nothing. Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, that's the point is that there is this connection happening, but it's not yeah. both ways. Uh, and it, it's really crucial to the plot um, yeah. in, in the metaphor of the story. But even like, you know, your average Friday the 13th, um, the sexuality is often baked in as part of its overall, as little metaphor as it has, <laughs> it's there. You, yeah. know, it's, you, know, it's, you know, which one like gets me like is the one in Terminator. And a lot of people forget it's in there. And I know that it's sort of the seed planting for for John Connor coming well, to be. Yeah. But it's yeah. like the way they did it and stuff. It was so like, you know, it's so funny. But when you talk about your lad, there's boobs and Terminator. A lot of people do not because it mm -hmm. wasn't important enough to remember that there were boobs in no. Terminator. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you saw you saw Linda Hamilton's body, yeah, in that movie, yeah. and and yeah, but you're right. It, it, the idea is supposed to be this is self fulfilling prophecy, and you know that uh, Kyle Reese is back in time and causes John Connor to be born. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's I, I think usually it's kind of a silly argument to be having, uh, you know, in the, in the sense that most things are a silly argument to be having. Um, yeah. You know, in some cases it works, in other cases maybe not. Uh, it depends on how good the film you're watching is. Yeah. Uh, you know, if the filmmaker knows what they're doing, um, you know, a sex scene can be a, a very, really interesting experience for a film, yeah. or it can have a metaphor, or it can have a, uh, you know, some sort of, or, you know, uh, you have a reaction to it that's more than just a boner. Um, yeah. You know, it's, uh, and you no, know, you know, are there films that absolutely use it for that purpose? Of course there are. Yeah. Um, the new argument right now is uh, a lot of people talking about. Um, Parifier, I guess, has to use a muted word, um, I guess, has a child being killed in it. And people are like, you know, oh, that shouldn't happen in horror films. I mean, like, it's been happening for a very long time. Um, Stephen King has done it many times and he did it well before any of these people were born. Um, but there is a fallacy that kids don't get killed very often in horror films. And I'm like, mm, watch enough of them. You'll see that's not true. Yeah, um, that's, they're, they're horror films and children are getting films. killed is horrifying. And, yeah, Job the reality, well done. <laughs> yeah. The reality of it. I think it was Guillermo del Toro who had said, um, he had a, a quote in, um, in something at some talking head document, I think it was hundred scariest movie moments. Um, he, where he talked about, he hated films where children were, uh, as he called them, like happy brainless catchphrase spewing creatures, uh, where he's like, yeah. And he was like, you know, in, he went and he made the film, the devil's backbone where he, his entire purpose behind the film was to discuss how, as he put it, uh, fundamentally unsafe it is to be a child. Yeah. And I was that always stuck with me because I'm like, you know, when you watch some of these types of films, um, you can see that happening where there is a there's a point where the filmmaker is either going to go in one direction or the other. And one of them is their happy brainless catchphrase spewing uh, Star Wars Episode one. Yippee. 
uh, you know, type stuff. And then you have these movies that are like, well, no, children are exceptionally vulnerable. Um, and, uh, and not, but not as vulnerable as you might think, because Mm -hmm. they actually do have some sense of agency. They do have thoughts and feelings and there are, uh, things that they are capable of doing to your point earlier about, you know, uh, this sort of grasping at a universal idea of what is acceptable for children and what isn't, um, when you children have, the ability to work shit out. They might occasionally need some help working it out. Um, And sometimes that help is helpful. And sometimes it's not. I remember as a kid, uh, another similar scenario, the exorcist, I think had its 10th anniversary. I was uh, five or six. The news did a story on it and there was footage of the exorcist in it. And I happened to walk Mm -hmm. into the room and was terrified and both of my parents both tried different aspects to explain to me why i shouldn't be afraid of it neither worked uh my mother was telling me it's just a movie and described the movie to me which made it worse because then i was imagining this possessed child running around my house <laughs> at, late at night and uh was terrifying <laughs> me and my father attempted a uh, a religious perspective he tried to say well uh at the time he was a he i i to mind feel my, my father is trans uh but at the time uh sorry it the the no i the, my the, my my son's progenitor is also trans i absolutely understand progenitor the, is a great word i should use yeah, that uh because yeah. it's always a minefield of yeah. describing it because and people get very confused yeah. and it's yeah, I get very yeah, confused no. and so yeah. i tend to use when telling stories about childhood prior to transition i tend to still use he him pronouns and i'm trying to work on that because i feel really badly about it although she and i haven't spoken in a very long time um but the uh, but at the time uh, the progenitor uh, uh, did say uh, tell me that Jesus had taken care of the demons in the Bible and I went well I don't think I believe in that uh, I'm a little <laughs> you know I'm a little kid I don't know if I'm really on board with that yet yeah um, and so the way I dealt with it was actually through all things uh, the real Ghostbusters cartoon I used to go to bed at night and imagine them chasing things I was afraid of yeah and then the nightmares stopped Dude, um, I had I did I had that the- on my own. <laughs> I had the biggest crush on the Egon character from that cartoon when I was hey, a kid. Egon, Egon was awesome in that show. Yeah. yeah. I was like early signs of my autism showing. <laughs> the um the so Poltergeist, love that as a kid, love that movie. Yeah. Um Exorcist was also good. The Exorcist series in general is like one of my dad's favorites. So he'll put that on and watch that. Mm-hmm. Um which is weird. Like I came into his house once. This is totally like an off story but um i went to his house i don't talk to him very often but he um i went there with my son and my son was like i don't know like 11 and he might instead of putting something on like exorcist or something that might be like fine for us he put on bad grandpa okay which is that's the kind of stuff i did not expose my son to like you know we had conversations when he was exposed to that stuff but we didn't normalize it in our house so like Mm. i was like what the like okay yeah. dad <laughs> i don't think i saw that one that's like but that's what gross out comedy yeah it's it was bad oh. it was i was just like it was not even it's not it's not like that i'm offended it's just not funny yeah right. it's you know yeah. i'm just like whatever that's so like just like bottom of the level have you even had sex before like it's that kind of humor yeah it's just, right. you know yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, i totally get that but I mean, it is it is uh, it is an aspect of something that I think that we as a culture have forgotten is that children are capable of working things out. Yeah. Um, and they're I think the job of the adult. Um, and again, I'm talking out of my ass because I don't have kids. But I mean, I think the job is to figure out how they need what kind of guidance they need. Yeah. Um, it's not a general idea. Um, you know, everybody. Because the, fa- the sad fact of the uh, sad fact of life is, I think that everybody gets fucked up at some mm-hmm. point or another as a kid. Something's going to happen, um, and it's it might be from your parents, it might be because of your parents, it could be because of something that happened at school, it could be happened something that happened uh, well outside. I mean, back in, back in my day, we used to go out and play in the woods and hit each other with sticks. I mean, like, yeah. and there's trauma well, there. But I think growing up in our society is inherently damaging. Yeah, because of like gender roles and 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 
these expectations oh, sure. around that and the ideas mm -hmm. around like what makes you successful and not successful and the generalizations around like how much money you have or not or what you look like. I mean, all of that stuff is all damaging. It's yeah. absolutely, we all have shit that we're going to have to, you know, and it, and it is, as you said, basically, ideally it comes down to the parents giving the kids like the tools to be able to navigate the world around them and what right. one child needs versus another, whether or not they came from your womb or not, yeah. um, are, is going to be different. And, but the mm -hmm. thing is like humans love to generalize in, in this way that like, if, that, that all friendships should be a certain way that the balance within friendships should be a certain way that relationships and romance and stuff are all a very specific thing. But then when, but if you actually break it down and try to do things in the right way, which to me is being like healthy, healthy minded about other people. So getting to know them so that you can do like, love them the way they need to be loved and they can love you the way you need to be loved and all that shit. So applying the context of the person to the situation, um, you know, like that just, it doesn't, those ideas don't work, right? This generalizations, right. they don't work, but that's like, people like go through life, like applying the generalizations and then being like, why don't, why not work? Why not work? And if like, we right. you need context. For yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's part of the reason why we have, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, you know, my father transitioning when I was, when I was eight. Um, you know, uh, she wow, waited. That's, that's like when you were eight. Yeah. So that, that was like, that must've been extra because that was like way before there was even like really oh. good language around it. Oh and yeah. Stuff. Oh yeah. It yeah. was tough. And it's part of the reason why I sometimes struggle with, uh, with pronouns, um, and stuff like that. It's not because I don't want to, or because I'm insensitive, but because when I grew up, we didn't talk about that. Yeah. Um, in fact, uh, I, it took me, uh, you know, 35 something years to realize um, how much um, damage came from that for me personally, not because of the transitioning, but because we were told this was 89, 88, 89, where both my parents were like, you do not talk about this with anybody. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and when I asked why, it was like, well, one, someone might try to hurt your father. And two the state might try to take you away. And yeah. so I'm thinking as an eight year old boy, I'm like thinking Dickensian workhouse, you know, like there's going to be rats and stuff, um, you know? And so I'm, I grew up um, with the idea of like, you know, uh, you don't talk about that. And so I would lie. People would ask questions about my father and I would be, Oh, he moved away. I don't know where he is. In reality, I went and saw her every weekend, like yeah. every other kid. But mm -hmm. I was not allowed to talk about it. And so I realized that, you know, when I got older that I'm like, I have trouble expressing my any truths of myself yeah, uh, because uh, truth leads to abandonment. Uh, yeah. And that is all because of society. And that's my point. Really, the reason why I brought it up was the idea that she had to wait until she was in her 30s to do that, because growing up in the world that she did that was not allowed. That was not talked about. And so yeah. we have us, we we're getting, you know, in some ways better about it where, you know, and that's when, when you have these legislations that are happening where they're trying to get rid of that conversation. And I'm like, no, 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 they should be transitioning at a younger age because they're learning who they are. Yep. Um, and, but you keep telling them because we can't seem to get rid of that stigma that we have a society where no kids have to be protected from that. I'm like, no, no, no. We need to talk about it more. Yeah. Because we need then, to allow, yeah. We need to allow kids to tell us who they are and then yeah. allow them to explore it. It's not, you know, people act like a kid coming out at three or four as trans means that you're going to be drugging them at that age. And that's not how it works. That's it's, not how it works. And some, and some kids do like get older and then be like, you know what? I don't want to do the hormones and some do. And it's like, but it's just giving, it's like, it, and ultimately it's just like, let them be, yeah, that whole thing is like, I'm very lucky I live in California and like yeah. people can just, you know, as long as you're closer to the ocean, you can be whoever you want right. to be and it's safe. And I know how privileged I am that I got to grow up like around a wide diversity of people, like, you know, being around gay people when I was a kid was like normal. I wasn't as aware of trans people. I was aware of the fact that it existed, but there wasn't even when my when my ex and I were together the word like wasn't there yet. Right. You know, there were other words that weren't 
particularly accurate, but that word wasn't there. And we knew that something was going on, but we didn't know what, and we didn't have Mm. the information to help my ex figure out what was going on. So it took my ex like, um, actually my ex had more kids with a subsequent partner and she, it was when her, the, her middle child. So her second child came out as trans at like age three or four that she was like, I think I'm trans. And then that, yeah, that's where it started for her. And, you know, she's like fully, she's fully transitioned and stuff. And then she, when she first realized it before she started anything, it was just doing the therapy part. She came and talked to me about it. Cause she knew, like, I would just be like, Oh yeah. Okay. And yeah. I'm, and I'm also very accepting. So, you know, like I have a lot of friends that I'm the person they come to, to come out to first, because I'm just like, you know, my mom's a lesbian. And when she came out, I already knew she was a lesbian before she knew she was a lesbian. Like her, her wife had to like convince her and be like, no, yeah. you like this, you know? And uh, when she sat down to tell me, she sat down next to her, her partner and she's like, puts her hand in her lap. And she's like, so, uh, and she was like shaking. I was like, mom, I've been waiting for this since I was like 13. She came out when I was like 21 or something. And she was like, yeah. what? She's like, what the fuck? And then her partner just starts laughing. She's like, I told you she's not going to care. I'm like, yeah, we know. That was that was similar to my experience. My mother was as well, but not with interestingly enough, not with my progenitor. Um, They they their their marriage was already basically over by the time my my uh, my father underwent transition. Um, But she immediately started dating women. Um, And then um, years later, when we were teenagers, my mother says, by the way, you know, that like, you know, me and, and my part and her partner at the time, I'm not going to say her name on a podcast, but, yeah. uh, her, her partner at the time, she's like, you know, we're together. And my brother and I both started laughing, like, where do you think Duh. we've been? Yeah. Like <laughs> there's been a woman in your life, pretty much our entire lives. Um, we were not naive enough. and our father is trans, like, you know, yeah. and, and, and my aunt has been a lesbian since the seventies. Like we know all about this. And the part of the reason why we were able to kind of just take all of this in stride was because it was talked about, we yeah. were having these conversations. And so, and when you limit conversation is when you start having problems, you know, yeah. and that's why, you know, and because of all that background, I was able to have a, a kind of a frank discussion with myself on how I felt about it. Like, would I be happier trans? Would I be, should I, am I gay? And I've came to the realization I was not neither of yeah. those things. I'm a heterosexual white cisgendered male, but I had that conversation with myself because I had the tools. I had the vocabulary that I was able to take that inventory and decide who I wanted to be. But yeah. if you don't have that conversation, if you don't have that vocabulary, how will you know who you are? And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and so you have to have that conversation. And there's nothing wrong with having that conversation. Yeah. Not only that, but like if you don't have access and exposure to being human in particular ways, how can you interact with and accept pe- other people that, right. that that language applies to. And, and I think like people who are like woke or whatever the, the fucking word would be right now, the people yeah. that, you know, um, are more accepting of humans, just being humans, they, mm-hmm. they forget that there are huge areas of this planet that people are very uniform and mm-hmm. aren't exposed. And as a matter of fact, like, TV over the decades has played a big role in helping yeah. desensitize people to things such as putting a black person into a predominantly white TV show that 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 was very popular with white people. They did it on purpose. Yeah, they're on like, purpose. Yeah, and to help with that because if you're not exposed to it and you've got all this bullshit ideas being fed to you when you're growing up, why are you going to think outside of that box? Like yeah. you're going to be uncomfortable by something that feels different and it's like you know, like change takes time. We can, it can be very easy to stand on like a moral high ground and be like, well, yeah. you know, these people should just, no, change takes time. And the amount that we have changed in the last hundred years as a species is mm-hmm. lightning fast. Okay. And yes. do I want things to be better? Absolutely. Yeah. But we're not going to get there overnight. And like, no. And screaming at everybody and be judgmental and not accepting of the fact that these things do take time is is silly it's like going to the gym and thinking you're going to be ripped because you went twice that's not how it fucking works like you know oh 
it drives me crazy. But no, yeah. but absolutely, representation matters, and it's uh, and the reason why it matters is because it is a way to have that conversation slowly. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. Uh, and yeah, I mean, like, but the it, but the idea of uh, what alarms me is that when you see this more prudish response to in particularly genre film which is where most of this stuff comes from horror has always been i hate when anybody says like oh horror shouldn't be political I'm like, it's always been political and it will always be political uh and part of the reason why it is political is because it's always been challenging preconception preconceived notions of how people are and yeah. so you you know you have to have those conversations and so that's why i mean like ultimately i do think that you know uh sex scenes so to, to your point though I'm on, on sex scenes um i think they do need to be i mean for example i just watched um interview with the vampire the new tv series it's wonderful and it is gay it's very gay <laughs> and there are gay sex scenes in it and i was happy to see them because i'm like no we need more if we're gonna have sex scenes have sex scenes for everybody you yeah. know we can't just have heterosexual sex scenes um and so you have these two very very attractive men having sex and you know and i'm like hey awesome you know yeah um but you well, know I, these yeah i was gonna say like i i'm so happy that they finally made the series because i hated the movies um they just were not i did not enjoy watching them and then um but i love the books right i read i consumed the books when i was younger sure. And um, I the TV show has just got that stuff in it. But the thing that I liked about the books um, is that the vampires, they're not their sexuality isn't like gay or straight or whatever. They're just sexual. Right. Yes. Yeah. And that's what you know. And I think like so when I watch that and I see those scenes, that's that's my kind of like, oh, they're just being sexual. And it's because I actually think the sexuality is on a spectrum. I know that people like really think yeah. the binary and then you have people trying to make it into like a trinary or whatever. And I'm like, no, 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 it's, yeah. it's a spectrum. It's, yeah. you know, um, and I think like that's something that Anne Rice always did really well with those books is allowing. Well, the, they they couldn't know? fuck in the books um they there was a lot those. of sex in yeah. those books yeah but they couldn't really have it they would have sexual encounters but their stuff didn't work in the i don't books. remember that oh uh but no i, I thought i, I just that. i guess i don't remember there being any emphasis on body parts it was just experience no so. that's yeah it was just experience but from uh, from what i've read about it i've read the original book a million years ago i never read the rest of them the listat stuff i know that occasionally like listat did different stuff became a human at one point he became a god at one point he can he did yeah. a bunch of stuff um but uh you know in, in but the idea behind it was this sort of as you put it this sort of spectrum of sexuality that while they couldn't actually engage in the physical act of sex they were still horny all the time and were having release through um, all kinds of sensory experience that was um as I always looked, I always looked at vampires as conceptually uh, post-human. They're not exactly working the same way we do. Uh, they mm -hmm. couldn't possibly. They they eat people. You know, they, yeah. it, 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 they they would have to examine humanity the same way we examine cows. You know, yeah. um, you know, at best, a human being is a good puppy. You know, until <laughs> yeah. until you decide you like them enough to make them a vampire. Um, yeah. You know, humanity would be a a. a to put it in more to put it in very specific terms like kind of a second class species according to vampires um and so you have this entire idea that and i think that's what Anne rice was really doing was this idea of you know they are not people in the traditional sense of the word they're not human um they have this whole other thing going on and uh and the fact that that could be interpreted as queer or read as queer is what make gives them power yeah. Um, and I think that that's wonderful. I've always liked that aspect of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that I, I'm glad to see more non heterosexual or non binary, um, physical interaction in television and film. Yeah. Um, and because it is about that conversation, it's about, you know, um, because I'd like to think, and the thing is to go back to what talking about my own kind of 
internal trauma about keeping secrets my whole life. Um, what worries me the most about like a lot of anti-trans or anti-gay or whatever legislation and stuff is that I'm not necessarily, I, I, I want to preface this by saying this is going to sound a little bit problematic, but what the thing that I think about, the thing that I can relate to is the idea that somewhere out there, there's another eight year old kid who is going to have to keep these secrets their whole life. Mm -hmm. And they're going to come out the other end uh, just as traumatized as I was. And it's not the trans people's fault. It's the people who are against the trans people that are the fault. Um, No, obviously my, uh, the reason why I said like, it may be a little problematic is that I don't want it to come off as if I'm not worried about the trans people or the, or the LGBTQ people. Cause I am of course. Yeah. But uh, what I can relate to my experience is I don't want another kid to grow up lying to the school counselor about where their dad is. Yeah. You know? um, and, and so like the more conversation that we can have in pop culture and particularly through genre film, which is what usually tends to be the most universal, um, media um i think that that's so valuable and yeah. um, so it does alarm me a little bit to see a little bit more of a, a younger generation being a little bit more prudish and uh because i worry that that conversation is going to get lost again and yeah. i think we've made so much progress with that conversation that i'd hate to see it go back and yeah. uh you know and go and and move backwards after all the fighting that's been mm-hmm. done um to see it regress um, yeah, does alarm me, and um, I'm I'm hoping that um, I'm hoping that we can get over it, and uh, and the more we can explore this in genre, um, is really helpful, and I, I really just hope we can keep having that conversation. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's so it's a, a little weird to 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 me to the way we coddle children a little bit, where more communication needs to be have less limit if that makes sense and yeah yeah. and so it's it's i'm trying to like kind of weave this all back together in some sort of uh actual thing that makes sense rather than me meandering (laughs) but but to our points that we've touched upon um you know i think that ultimately the the main thesis there is more communication not less and that means pushing boundaries that means upsetting people on occasion and uh, and so I mean I I really hope you know Twitter can relax a little bit. I yeah, guess that's what <laughs> I'm getting at. Humanity but, in general, like yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's not it's every like people just and all the divisiveness that has been cultivated over the last five years or so just through yeah. like hysterical communication online and mm-hmm. and like a lot of these like media companies that are you know put out news news shit that feed into that like yeah. i think they should all be held accountable like i agree you know if yeah. you're if your headline suggests something that the article isn't actually about no you get dinged you gotta pay some money like you know there should just be yeah. like there, there needs to be some accountability for that stuff because the average person doesn't even realize how they're being manipulated right, right. you know mm-hmm. so it's uh yeah and i i definitely agree that i just think like I just wish that we could get to the point that people were not so insecure that they felt threatened by people who aren't like them, because that's really what it comes down to. You know, it's like, who cares what other people do with their body parts? Who cares what people, you know, I don't like, you know, who cares what that person likes chocolate cake? I don't like chocolate cake. I don't care. I'm not offended. They can have it. I'm not going to eat it. Don't make me right. eat it. That's the only thing, right? Yeah. Like mm-hmm. is don't force other people. And that's the problem when people are on the conservative side is they're trying, they're feeling threatened because of people doing shit in their own houses and not forcing it on them. And they're trying to force their perspective. And that's like, I don't By care. accusing that side of pushing their perspective yeah yeah and i don't care like what you believe if you're trying to force people to do stuff to control them if you're trying to control other people then you're part of the problem i don't care if i agree with your ideas or not you're part of the problem like people can dislike other people can dislike gay people okay like i there are a lot of people that are gonna get freaked out like if they Mm -hmm. were to listen to my podcast and be like no that's not okay no no it is totally okay to not like gay people it is not okay to limit gay people in their lives make Mm -hmm. laws or 
abuse them for it yeah. you just don't have to be gay you don't have to invite them to your house for dinner no. you can set boundaries to have your life the way that you like it you don't have to like yeah. people that wear orange it's fine but you know it's your business and keep it to yourself you know yeah and no, i agree it's it's the fact that it's getting into the laws and stuff that I have the problems. And then and then the other people are making it not OK to have your own personal feelings. That bothers me, too. I'm like, there's mm. that's it's overstepping. We need to keep the laws from controlling people. And we're not doing a good okay. job of that right now. And yeah. uh, <laughs> well, laws are know? supposed to laws are supposed to, by definition, they're supposed to be protecting. Yeah. Um, that's their entire purpose. That's why that's illegal to murder. It's supposed to be like, well, no, it's not necessarily about a moral judgment. It's about maybe killing people just as something we shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, and so there's a law against it. Um, yeah. that's why there's technically a law against uh, against committing suicides because we agree it's probably a bad thing. Um, you know, it's uh these laws are are supposed to be there to protect the population, not limit that population. Yeah. And government's supposed to be helping, not not repressing. Um yeah. that's the reason why we have it. You know, the reason why it was created was to, you know, to try to keep people from hurting one another in some way. Um, and instead, we've got a we're now entering into more and more into a political scenario in which more and more um, government is is designed to control uh, or or repress. Uh, and that is uh, that's very alarming. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of things that are very alarming um and so i think that's why i really like uh media it's <laughs> so i can yeah. i don't have to worry about it there um yep. or if i do it's it's safe it's it's a, it's a safe place to to deal with these issues and have yep. these conversations um which is why you know i love podcasting because you can have these conversations and they're just they're just talk you know yep. it's it's uh maybe somebody will listen to this and and find their mind changed but probably not um yeah but that, you know, it's a safe place to have a conversation. And, yeah. and, you know, I feel, I mean, I felt safe enough to, to talk a little bit about, you know, my experience growing up with a trans parent, um, you know, and that's not something I would be willing to do at work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, this is, you know, podcasting is a safe place because you can just kind of express yourself and people can be upset about it, but I don't have to hear them. So, yeah. um, but yeah, I mean, so that's why I mean, uh, again, to to tie back into, you know, representation matters in these films and in TV and books and comics and what have you, because it's increasing a conversation. It's moving it forward yeah. um, in a safe way. You can have that conversation about a fictional character and that can't hurt anybody by definition. Yeah. You know, uh, the character can't doesn't feel anything. The character isn't real. Um, you know, the story is a fiction. Uh, you yeah. Know, we but can, it. it it allows people to have something to relate to yeah. who maybe wouldn't have the opportunity normally to get to relate. So they get to see themselves in these characters and, yeah. and it also exposes people to, you know, and that's, you know, one of the reasons why I am all, I talk about a lot of things really openly is because you never know what is going to be relatable to somebody and being yeah. able to relate to someone, especially on com around conversations of things that are, taboo or less frequently talked about can be very like reassuring and empowering mm -hmm. for people and you know um and then it, and then it can be educational as well for other people some people it's yeah. like you know they just they've never been exposed to an idea and you know it's like you give it to them and they're like well okay you know yeah so and i i i definitely i definitely enjoy that i have like my media feeds are very um, controlled. So if you were to look at my like Google news feed thing, there's no like politics or pop culture or anything like that's all like science. And there's some like, I occasionally read like um, advice columns because it's very interesting to me to see like what these people, what people ask questions about. Cause a lot of times it's stuff that I would never need help with. I'm just like, Really? But it's very yeah. interesting to see their feedback. And like, I never, I, okay, 90% of the time, I do not agree with Miss Manners at all. Like, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's all about the lies. And I'm like, there's I'm still like, Miss uh, Manners? <laughs> I didn't realize that was still a thing. All right. yeah. yeah. And uh, she's, she likes to lie about stuff. And um, yeah, so that stuff's fun. But I mostly read just like science articles and stuff like that. And then, but man, on Twitter is so hard 
to get the politics out, no matter how careful I am, even the people who I normally like, I follow and I want to see their stuff, they will start with with the politics and they'll, they'll you know, like post somebody else's thing because they didn't like what they said. And then they they call them names or say that they deserve to like die or something. And I'm like, I don't like you anymore, Mute. Like, <laughs> yeah. I try not to do the I try not to do the latter. Uh, but I mean, I do apologize for the former. I do. I do occasionally uh, uh, get a little invested in political uh, ideology, but only because I, I much for the same reason, like I with the podcast is I feel like if if uh, maybe somebody needs to hear it so they feel better about themselves. I don't know. I mean, I'm a, still a small account, like much like uh, you are and many other people are. Um, but no, I do agree with you on the latter part. I do really do hate the retweeting of something that is upsetting. Yeah. Um, and then I, and I have to look at it and I don't want to look at it. Yeah. I don't want to uh, see it. And I also, I feel like those people that put that negativity out there, they do it partially because it attracts attention. Right. And so I don't want to empower them. They do not deserve like no. the attention at all. Like, and um, like on the rare occasion that I share something like verbally abusive that someone said to me, I make sure that I remove all of their user info yeah. so that they are not, they do not get any attention at all. A screenshot um, is also your friend. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you don't so have to retweet their account. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm sharing it without participating in the conversation. I'm not adding to it and stuff, but I'm very like, it's very rare for me to do it. And I usually do it because it was funny. Like what they said mm -hmm. was just so ridiculous that I'm like, <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's, it, it needs to be stated that you don't deserve that too. I mean, like, you know, it, it, that's unacceptable behavior from the beginning, you know, yeah. nobody should be, nobody should be attacking anybody on social media, but, um, and, and, and you're a nice person. So I don't know why anybody would do that, but I don't know. People are, yeah. they, I don't, it's never relevant to me. It has nothing to yeah. do with me. So I'm going to pause for a second. Um, sure. mm -hmm. yeah, the, I'm getting surgery on my toe in a couple of weeks and it's because he broke my toe. Oh yeah. Well, so cats are fun. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Um, yeah, so Saturday we're going to be recording again, uh, but for your mm -hmm. podcast, and we're yep. going to be doing a Halloween special, which will I'll make sure there are links in the description for this episode, so that if anyone wants to come hang out with us for that, um, they'll be able to watch that, and that'll air closer to Halloween, right? Yep. Yep. The episode will go out uh, probably just the week of Halloween, probably a couple of days prior. Okay. Um, but yeah, um, we're in the middle of a. a halloween movie thing on uh on our show this month and so uh we'll be doing our annual halloween special which is usually just us goofing off it won't really be a a great representation i think of what we normally do but mm -hmm. um it will be fun i think it's a it's a really so paul lind uh the paul lind halloween special uh available on youtube if you listen to this and you want to go watch it before we talk about it um it's really dumb and silly and uh <laughs> 1970s uh variety show thing which is uh blissfully faded from public memory we don't do the uh variety shows anymore uh but you know it's it's very donnie and marie um if you've seen the star wars hollow uh star wars holiday special which was around the same time <laughs> it's kind of like that uh you know it's except it's done more or less like uh more on stage uh but paul lind is a uh quite the character and yeah it'll it'll be fun to to kind of goof off and talk about that so i think i i hope you'll have a good time when you come on yeah i think I, I, yeah. i'm sure i will i'm easy yeah. so hopefully you guys have a good time with me there that's more that's more where my concern is i i almost always have a good time no matter what i do but sure. <laughs> as long as i'm not listening to people eat <laughs> no 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 we, that's we don't my do boundary that. yeah yeah but cool well mm -hmm. um i'm glad that you offered to to come on and um i had fun and i like i actually really enjoyed the way that we were talking about like real world real life things but then it's still tied into like movies and media that's like that's so my brain doesn't work that way so like i actually like really enjoy that perspective it gives me something to think about when i'm watching stuff i like containing my uh my my thought process as best i can especially when i i can't help but think whenever i do podcasting i always think about audience 
And so I'm thinking, well, what, you know, do I want the host to just ramble on and do nothing? Uh, or do I want to hear them talk about something specific? And so I try to keep thoughts tied back together. Um, and so it's, uh, uh, and so hopefully the audience uh, of this episode will will enjoy my uh, my antics, uh, so to speak. Yeah. But and I hope well, you did as well. I, I had a nice time. I think you're very yeah. nice, and it's been nice to be on here. And so anytime you need a guest, I'd be happy to to come back. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Maybe maybe they'll like you more than me because I ramble <laughs> like without. I, oh, I'm ADHD sure that's not. Is, no, trust me, it's it's something else. But but it's like you know, contain chunks all together. <laughs> Uh, well you're a very charismatic host and, and you have a nice voice so i'm sure they like you just fine awesome cool. yeah. well thank you and uh thanks everybody for hanging out with us and uh i hope you have a good week and all that stuff and uh we're gonna be doing the the question and answer session so if you want to check that out you have to check out my patreon so all right goodbye thank you for hanging out and listening a huge thank you to my patrons. I could not do this without you. Want to support my creative chaos and get access to exclusive content? Check out my Patreon. Have questions and are interested in joining me for a conversation? Email me 